Hey there, welcome to Everyday Torah. Uh, as you know, I am seeking to have many dialogue partners uh, because, uh, I don't know, maybe it's different strokes for different folks, uh, who knows, but there are different facets of the Bible of life that I am uh, wanting to discuss. And Heidi has been a longtime friend, and Heidi uh, knows her Bible well. She is a counselor therapist. And Heidi, I, I think I could introduce you, but you would do a much better job at introducing yourself. So why don't you tell our listeners uh, who you are? Okay, well, thank you for having me on today. It's a joy to meet with you in this capacity and share our love of Yeshua. So um, I have been at the same institution that Traver has been at for about the last five years. And so we have partnered together in the School of Theology. And so um, that is how I have met Traver. But in the other hats that I wear, I am a board certified and licensed therapist. So I'm always looking at things from a relational perspective. So when I read the Bible, I'm not just looking at it from a theological perspective because I do have a seminary degree, but I'm looking at it from a clinical perspective, from a neuropsychological perspective. And so I think that that um, gives me a better way to understand my clients, and it gives me a better understanding of why they're the way they are when I open up the Tanakh and see what's going on with Adam and Eve and subsequent family from the Bible. So Heidi, uh, part of the reason I feel the need to talk with someone like you is I don't know that a lot of listeners, they probably just don't even know this story, is that when I first you know, discovered the Torah and that that was important for Christian living. Um, I wasn't going and reading my Bible because I wanted to figure out that the law was for me. That was not my goal. My goal, rather, was, okay, if I really want to make disciples of Jesus, I need to know what is a disciple and how is one made. And so I was really uh, concerned about the methodology by which God would put his kingdom into us. And I didn't know if that happened by osmosis. Was it the spirit? Was I just to read the Bible over and over again? Was that it? Was, was I supposed to just look at Jesus and try to mimic Jesus? What was I supposed to do? And so I think what happened to me was I was looking at uh, how did God educate us? How does God instruct us? And so in that, I uh, was looking at the Torah and you know, I just started to get honest with myself and started to figure out that these laws, these uh, these things that God had given us to do were, were ways that shaped me. And one of the things that I think about when I think about you uh, with your background in neuroscience and how uh, people, I guess, engage each other in relationship, I think, I mean, you're going to offer a piece to our listeners that... Uh, I don't know that I'll be able to fully articulate. On my end, I figured out that we don't learn in a vacuum. It's like God wanted to shape our worlds first, shape uh, our environments first, and, and that is large. That largely happens by way of obedience. So when we do those things, we create an environment for ourselves, and then out of that, it's like that creates the crucible by which we understand God. So I, I just wanted the listeners to know that's part of the reason why we're together and you're going to, this won't be our only conversation. So I think it would be good for our listeners before we even get into that. And you, and you've, you've talked to me offline. You said, Hey, let's talk, just, just, uh, you know, talk about, um, you know, who you are first and we'll, we'll get to all those granular, mm -hmm. granular, I can't even say the word level granular. things, granular <laughs> level things later. Thank you. Uh, but you haven't been um, engaged with the Torah all your life. No, I haven't. And, you know, I was thinking about that, um, just how Yeshua, from a very early age, placed a love for God in my heart before I was able to even know that there should be. I can remember being eight, looking out the window at night and, like, agonizing. How, how if God is, 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 the creator of the world, then who created him? I can remember having this like agonizing dialogue with myself when I was eight. And I was raised in a 
Christian home, but there was no evidence. We went to church on Sunday. There was no evidence of walking in the ways of Yeshua. And so as my life progressed and I got, I actually got into ministry, I've been a pastor. So when you are a pastor, you are teaching the word of God with the most pure way that you know how, but here's what was happening. I began to see, especially the Old Testament, I began to see things that are part of Torah that I had not organized in that fashion in my thinking as Torah. So um, I was teaching as a pastor, I was, I was teaching the Old Testament, I was teaching the the um, appointed times without having an organized understanding that, hey, I'm teaching Torah. Now, so our listeners don't have a little brain hiccup. So <laughs> you're, ha- you're referring to yourself as a, a senior pastor here, a pastor? I've been a, I've been a senior pastor. Mm-hmm. Okay. So how, how are our listeners supposed to understand this? There'll be some that come like, oh, boy, women should not be in leadership. Now, I don't oh. hold that view. I don't hold that view, uh, but I would like to hear, uh, uh, it might be helpful for people to understand, uh, what do you mean by that? So for me, uh, first of all, I have no problem with uh, women teaching, with women um, uh, leading. I don't have any problem with that. I think what I do have a difficulty with is... um, uh, some of the structures that we have set up for ourselves where people are over one another. That, I think, is a, it's a bad structure itself. So in that regard, yeah, um, the, the structure itself is bad. I think it has uh, created a, um, uh, a one over another type of relationship, and it shouldn't be. So how... How are we to understand this? How are you unpacking that, I guess? I mean, yeah, let's work through this because I think that would be a hiccup for some people. How do you understand this? How do I understand being a pastor? Oh, I don't know how to say it. Um, How? See, I don't see senior pastor in the Bible. Let's just put it that way. I don't see it. I see shepherds in the Bible, and shepherds can be men or women. That's completely fine. I am complementarian, though, and I don't know. We've not talked about this in this way. <laughs> so tell me, you have egalitarian and you have complementarian. Do you know the difference theologically when I say those two words? I, I, I suspect you do. I do, but before we embark on that, I would like to say that I am no longer a pastor in a church and that my theology has evolved past where I was talking about when you started going to senior pastor dialogue. (laughs) Okay. So here's, here's what I see. And I don't, uh, at some point I would love to have this conversation deeply and theologically, because when we look at the Hebrew, the, the other day I was kayaking, I live on a big lake, a 50 mile big lake in Washington. And I was, I was paddling my kayak yesterday Mm -hmm. and from a distance, from a far distance, I thought, what I was this a floating dock that had broken loose from someone's from someone's shore area there? Was this a floating dock? How, what is that? And as I got closer, it was probably a football field from it. As I got closer, I saw that it was actually a, just a big giant log. It wasn't a dock, but from a distance, the perspective that I had skewed what I was seeing because mm-hmm. of the way that the current was flowing on the lake. Yeah. So my point is that we come up with presuppositions Yeah. that we bring into our churches and the way we're practicing our faith that are from that distance, like I just described, where I wasn't really able to see it clearly because I wasn't near enough to it. And I think we always need to go back to the actual Hebrew. And if we understand that Hebrew is a is a pictographic language, and if you don't see the uh, the picture of that, if you just see the words that are translated with the vowels inserted, you lose a large part of the meaning of what that 
context is. So the Hebrew is a dy- dynamic, flowing language, mm-hmm. where the Greek is an analytical language, person, place, thing, noun. Hebrew is looking at the dynamic, like the difference between maybe water flowing, which would be Hebrew, in Greek would be what are the chemical components of water. Yeah, okay. So when you look at the Hebrew and you look at the original narrative of creation, you see a different picture of Adam and Eve than what we see practiced in many churches today. There is the over and under today in the churches. So when I look at Adam and Eve, and I don't want to take the time to go into it today because that's not what we were yeah, yeah, hoping to aim at. I gotcha. But I see that Adam and Eve are equal. And I see that together they bring a whole image of God. Yeah. Well, I would, I would, uh, and for me, that would be the uh, equal but complementarian view, meaning mm-hmm. that they have different roles, uh, but right. together they make this whole and one is com- incomplete without the other. And of yes. course, our modern church structures have uh, created a, a, a crucible, uh, a, a framework uh, by which, in my mind, that uh, right uh, complementarian view cannot be rightly expressed. Does, is that correct in your view or not? Yes, I understand it that way. Okay. Okay, keep going. Uh, yeah, keep going. I, I I, I had to. I had to. I had to ask that question because I know that that is a question that everyone's going to be asking. We're going to get back to that. Great. That we're going to get back to that. I think it's. Uh, you can either continue to comment on it, or uh, I guess continue on uh, your journey and why you have uh, loved Jesus all your life and uh, figured out Torah is very much for the believer. Okay. Well, I think for me about five, five years ago, five years ago, I started practicing a Sabbath because I really didn't have, you know, and it's such a strange thing. Cause I went to seminary, and I worked in a church and I didn't have a complete understanding of Sabbath from a biblical perspective. And that is not uncommon. In fact, I think it's atypical for most pastors in the Christian church today to understand Sabbath is actually at sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. So I began to try to be faithful to the practice of Sabbath about five years ago. But seven or eight years ago, I had the opportunity in this mega church that I was working in to begin teaching for a couple of years through 1 Samuel. And every single lesson seemed to come back to obedience. And people would say to me, I'm so sick and tired of every Sunday your conclusion being you need to be obedient. <laughs> they were resistant to that. You know, they were resistant to the Sabbath. They were resistant. And I um, began to take a journey that uh, has led me to this point of now thinking of myself as being a messianic Christian or messianic Jewish, if you want to call it that. Um so that's that's how I am here today. And it was really not because I had made a decision to walk in a particular way. It was really me uh, following the promptings that the Spirit had placed in me and being faithful to follow what I was hearing. And um, that's how I have come to this point in my life. Well, then how you how did you go from okay, so this Sabbath thing might be uh, for me, uh, and that's in the Ten Commandments. How did you make the leap from Sabbath keeping to, well, hey, maybe that, maybe all of that Torah appropriately applied would be for me too. How did you make that jump? I don't know that I made a, a, like this cognitive decision to, okay, this is what I'm going to do now. I think it was really a matter of just, be so in love with Yeshua that I continue to dig deeper in my own time in the morning of Bible study and, you know, prayer and, and God would put people in my path. I mean, God put you in my path. So working together, hearing you speak helped, you know, to 
bring into more refinement um, and understanding of um, Torah. Okay, so uh, maybe you, uh, again, because it's our first time together in a, in a YouTube I feel format. like we're not talking about anything I thought we would. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we're a free flowing dialogue here. Uh, well, uh, you once told me that, uh, uh, well, you even sent it to me. You sent me a paper that you wrote a long time ago. I think you were writing about Sukkot. And I, I would, it would be cool for you to tell people what that paper was about, what you were thinking about, uh, because I, what I have found in my life that as I talk to people, my, my, the, my life trajectory is about being a disciple of Jesus. That's the goal. Torah keeps popping up over and over again. Incidentally, mm-hmm. people think that's my thrust. That's not my thrust. My thrust is to be in love with Jesus. But I can't get away from the Torah because the Torah gives me instruction on how God wants me to live. So when you and I started talking about the Torah, it wasn't like new to you. These were things that you had already been thinking about. So how far did that go back for you? In other words, there's some uh, seedlings that were kind of popping up even before uh, you and I started talking. What was that like? Uh, I don't know if I can like remember exactly what that was like. What I can tell you is that I was teaching. I remember I turned 50 in the year that, you know, it was the, um, you know, the Jubilee year. Mm -hmm. And I, and I remember saying to somebody, this is so cool. (laughs) I'm turning 50 in the year of Jubilee. This has got to be, and they're like, Jubilee, what are you even talking about? And I'm like, this has got to be just a really cool year for me. I'm going to be coming into a harvest. I can just tell it's a, it's a spiritual thing. I'm 50 in the year of Jubilee. And, uh, you know, I, that same year, I can remember teaching about the appointed times and, you know, And people were looking at me like, what are you even talking about? We are New Testament people. And I'm like, no, I don't see that there's a division in that. Why why do you think there's a division? Man has put the the verse and chapter and, you know, separated the Old Testament from the New Testament. Man has done all that. That isn't how Yahweh wrote his word. It's a beginning to end. And so I was, I was, I was getting some pushback from people Uh about the way I was teaching the Bible. And so from a clinical perspective with my therapist hat on, the way I really see things is that what was lost in the fall was actually intimacy. Because if you look at, if you look at the end, the last verse of chapter two, it says they were naked and they knew no shame. And remember now there's nothing that's superfluous in the Bible. There's nothing superfluous. Mm-hmm. Every word means something. Okay. Even if it's repeated, it means something. So we have there at the end of chapter two, Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame. Then it goes right into the, the narrative of the fall. Okay. In, in Genesis three. Mm-hmm. And then right at the end, right at the end of that whole thing, what, what happens? What's the first thing? Now they know they're naked. And they're, they have fear. They're separated. Now they have fear. Yeah. And they know they're naked. So what's the difference between the end of chapter two, where they were naked and knew no shame? Right. And now the end, the last verse of chapter three, now they're naked and they are afraid and they know shame. So what, what has happened there? And then they go through the curse of the ground and the curse of the snake. Okay. And then we look at what's happening with Adam and what's happening with Eve. They're going to have sorrow, sorrow and childbirth. If you look at the Hebrew, sorrow and childbirth, sorrow and tilling the ground. And the next thing that happens, verse one, chapter four, Adam knew Eve. What I see is they are, and I'm looking at this from a 21st century perspective right now. Okay. What they've done is now they're trying to make themselves feel better. And the response to the trauma, think about the trauma. Think about, we're, we're not able to see things from an, a pure, pristine perspective of being 
in paradise and God saying, okay, now you're cut off. Okay. Now you're banished from the garden. You're banished from paradise. That's mm -hmm. got to be dramatic. So, so as a clinical therapist, I'm thinking, okay, first of all, they're having trauma, fear, anxiety, the whole thing gets creeping in there. Yeah. Trust is broken. And when we think about trust being broken, intimacy is lost, right? When trust is broken, intimacy is lost. And what's their response to that? They had sex. They're trying to make themselves feel better. That's the immediate thing that happens. They're trying to make themselves feel better. And so we see a trajectory in motion now of, it's not that it was an illegitimate thing for them to have relations. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. But I'm thinking from a clinical perspective, now what they're doing is they're trying to make themselves feel better. Because if you start, if you, if you understand what's happening neurochemically, they are feeling better. They're having endorphins, you know, oxytocin, the whole, all of the feel good chemicals are coming now. Okay. So, and so go ahead. Oh, I'm just, okay. Are you saying in that instance that they are potentially um, having sex to make themselves feel better? I am saying if you look at people today, mm -hmm. whether it's having sex, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's shopping, whether it's gambling, what are the reasons that they're doing those things? Well, because they're seeking to feel good and whole. They're trying to feel better. It's an illegitimate way uh -huh. to get a legitimate need met. The legitimate need was the, to be in right alignment with Yeshua. That was the legitimate need to be in right alignment with Yeshua. But because of what happened in the garden, they became out of alignment. And so from a neuroscience perspective, what would be happening with them is they would have what we term to be chaos. Okay. There's either chaos or rigidity that comes from being out of alignment, out of alignment with your true self. Adam and Eve fell out of alignment with who they truly were they fell out of alignment. So they're having chaos. And I'm speaking from a neurological perspective. Mm -hmm. And so to bring order, to bring order, they're trying to make themselves feel better. Okay. So that's what I'm thinking. If I were to summarize and try to um, work this out a little bit, Adam and Eve, uh, they knew each other uh, before the fall, they were uh, uh, the sexual intimacy relationship would have been healthy, right, and good. Uh, okay, but the text doesn't say that. Ah. It says in four one, it says, "And Adam knew Eve." It says that it happens there. Are you saying that you're? Is there an assumption ah, on your part I guess that it's is, happening elsewhere? There is an assumption on my part. There's an assumption that they were having. Uh, <laughs> I do feel a little bit awkward saying this, but I guess I need to get in touch with my other self. Uh, there, I, my assumption is that they were engaged in sexual relations uh, before chapter four. That is my assumption. Maybe it I should not say that. It does not say that. Not that I can it recall. Says, chapter four, and Adam knew Eve. Yada. He knew her, Eve. Yada. But that doesn't make sex bad. No, you're right. It doesn't. So how but does sex look, become good then? <laughs> you want to have that conversation? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I want to. Well, I, I would like to think that when uh, uh, Amy and I engage sexually, that uh, it is not a uh, uh, anything on my part to seek to make me whole, uh, but okay. it is. I know but I want to learn what's just here. Happened. But look what's just happened. And I wasn't prepared to talk about all this. But but look what's happened. Okay. So so we have we have the creation narrative. Uh-huh. Okay. And and I don't have my Bible right in front of me, but but uh, God creates Adam and, and the animals, and then he parades the animals in front of he he says it is not good for man to be alone right mm -hmm. and then the very next thing is he parades all those animals in front of adam yeah 
Okay, so what's happening? He's saying it's not good for man to be alone. So he parades animals in front of Adam. Why wouldn't he just create Eve? But he didn't. He paraded the animals in front of him. That's right. And and Adam discovered there's no equal for me in these animals. There's these things that creep along the ground, the the, the beasts of the ground. There's there's no one of my kind here for me. Uh -huh. And then he creates, God creates Eve out of Adam's side. Yeah. So the animals are created from the ground, right? But Eve is created from Adam's side, his equal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And so then, then out of that, you're assuming that they're having sex here at this point. I would have assumed Okay, but it doesn't say that. I, well, look, I, I'm 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 tracking with you. I just I didn't look. Sometimes um, I'm going to be uh, discovering right here in front of all of our viewers that I might have assumed something that uh, was not the case, and I assumed I'm going to like have to go back and read it again. But you're but I cannot recall. Uh, any mention of sexual relationship before that? I, you're right. I can't. Right. I know. I'm trying to see. You're here. Here you are. You're you're a, a clinical therapist, and you're seeing this as uh, deeply relevant to what you do in bringing wholeness to people. Yes. Mm -hmm. So so when we look at then, Adam has not named. Eve, right? Mm -hmm. And there's this idea out there in the theological world. Well, God gave him this woman and he told her to name her. That isn't what happened. If you read, if you read that text mm -hmm. and you read it from a Hebrew perspective okay. of the language, okay. what's happening is he parades the animals. God parades the animals. There's no kind for, for Adam to pair with. He sees that Eve is made from his side. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he still hasn't named her then they go through the creation they go through the narrative in the garden okay and satan shows up who at this point no one is questioning why a snake would be standing upright and talking no one no one seems to think that that is odd right <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so then they get the temptation and they eat the apple or whatever the fruit really was okay then they you know, they're hiding the fig leaf and the whole thing. And after that, after that, Adam names Eve. And if you look at the Hebrew of that, and I really wasn't prepared to have this conversation, but that according to people like Skip Moen, Rabbi Foreman, they're going to say that perhaps this was a name of putting it under putting Eve under his authority, putting her in, in the animal realm by naming her like he was naming the animals that paraded before him. Okay. And if you look at the Hebrew, and I don't have the consonants right before me, but I think it was H-V-V-H. I can't remember right now. But if you look at that, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how they put that. So, it seems like the correlate in there is of some resemblance of a snake. Okay. Okay. So if you look at Skip Moen and if you look at Rabbi Foreman, they're, they're speculating that that is his name of, for her, that is a, um, a dishonored name at this point. He's putting her, not because it was a divine appointment from God for him to name her, but for her to now be under his authority, even though that was not what God had originally designed. Okay, gotcha. Just as a caveat for our listeners, uh, uh, if you know who uh, David Foreman is or Skip Moen is, this is not an endorsement of all that they think. However, uh, Heidi and I, uh, we talk enough offline. Uh, we know some of their theologies, and uh, that doesn't mean that we carte blanche endorse all that they say. We would not do that. Uh, but there are plenty of things that we can learn from folks uh, that um, we uh, disagree with on some major points, but we can still learn from them uh, quite a lot. So anyway, with that caveat, um, Heidi, continue. Uh, okay. There's a, you're, you're, cu you're culminating in a point here, and, I'm, and I want to get to that point. Okay. So all of that to say, 
they culminate their relationship in Genesis 4, 1. And what is the fruit of that? The fruit of that is their son is a murderer, king. That's the fruit of that. And so, you know, when you start looking at what the original role of Eve was prior to Genesis 3 and the Garden of Eden, if you, if you look at her role as the Ezer Connecto, which would be the boundary keeper, which would be the, um, and the spiritual guide, so to speak, right? And Adam's role is of the, you know, um, Zakar, I think is the Hebrew for that, which would be the one to remember, the one to obey, right? When you, when you see them in that complementary way, now we've got this dynamic that is um, really unhealthy. So I want to put this in a clinical uh, terminology for you. And what I want to say is I'm an attachment therapist. And so for our viewers who don't know what that means, uh, attachment therapy is uh, 70 some years ago, this was put into being where through research, they discovered there's actually four types of attachment. Secure attachment is the first one. And then there's three insecure attachments. And I don't want to get into all of that and what those things are. But what I can tell you is that once Adam and Eve were separated from that perfect alignment with Yahweh, they would have had an insecure attachment this way with Yahweh and this way with one another, because they would have been operating out of fear and anxiety that had to be a very fearful thing for them. So what I'm saying in all of this is that Torah is that, is that peace that brings them into right alignment. That's what brings God's people into right alignment because a secure attachment is where I feel safe, seen, soothed because I'm in alignment and my, I'm, I'm following, I'm following the prescribed order of how to live my life. Adam and Eve had a prescribed order and, uh, Foreman would say, if you're familiar with quantum physics or quantum mechanics or entanglement, are you familiar with entanglement? I am. What he would say is that Adam and Eve be, between the um, tree of life and the tree of good and evil or the tree of knowledge, they really would have been at that in-between state. They hadn't made a decision yet whether they would choose life or choose death. And so they were at that in-between stage. And so when they ate from the tree of knowledge, basically they, cho they chose death and they, cause they, they had a concept of right and wrong. Evil was already in the world, right? Satan had already fallen. Lucifer had already fallen. Evil was already a, a concept, but they brought it into time by eating from the tree of knowledge. They didn't, they, they thought they would become like these superhuman people. But what they discovered was just that they were naked. That's what they discovered. Can I ask, I, I want to backtrack just a little bit. Uh, you talked about a, um, a pre-fall uh, complementary state that Adam and Eve would have been in that would have been right and healthy and good. Is that right? I'm saying they were in alignment, but they hadn't chosen from the tree, which of those they were going to eat from, mm -hmm. right? They hadn't chosen it. And I'm saying that there are people out there such as Foreman who would say that that was an issue of quantum entanglement right there where they hadn't made the decision of life or death. Yet. Okay. They hadn't chosen. Okay. So the part I'm, I was thinking through is uh, you talked about, uh, you know, I do see uh, male, female, uh, when we're together and rightly together, it's uh, this whole right, good, no shame. But you were using words like um, boundary keeper. Uh, how are you? Can you go back to that? And what were you saying there? Is is there a uh, uh, a part that Eve, that female, was uh, that was the role in the whole, and then there was a male role in the whole? Is there is that work? Is that how you're understanding it? Yes. Okay. What are those? Okay. So <laughs> I wish I had some kind of notes here to talk to you about that. But Adam's role, if you look at the Hebrew, mm -hmm. 
Adam's rule, and I'm not talking about, think about if it's, if, if, when we look at Hebrew, if we just open, say, a lexicon of some sort, okay, you're going to see the consonants filled in with vowels. You're not going to see like the word play and the, um, the relational structure is if, if, if you were just looking at the pictographic language. Sure. Okay. So when we look at the entirety of that, you see that Adam was the, I think the word is Zakar is the Hebrew. And he, that makes him the one who is to remember who God is and who he is. That's his role. Okay. Is to remember who God is and who he is. And then Eve's role as the, um, uh, as their connecto would have been to be the boundary keeper, the one who would keep her husband in, in line, who would be the spiritual guide, so to speak, to help him to remember. She would be the relational person, uh. the one, the keeper of relationships. So when you look at in Genesis three, where the ground is cursed. It's not Adam that's cursed. It's not Eve that's cursed. It's the ground that's cursed and it's the snake that's cursed. But we see the words for the toil of the land and the pain of her childbirth. If you actually look at the original language of that, that's really sorrow. And so he, Adam is going to have the sorrow of toiling with the earth. He was already going to till the soil before Genesis three. Mm -hmm. She was already going to have children before Genesis three, but Adam is now going to have sorrow associated with trying to till the soil. It's not always going to be easy for him. Eve, who's going to be the keeper of relationships is going to have trouble, not just in her relationship with Adam, but even with her own family, the sorrow will be in keeping relationships. Think about in 21st century people and families. Isn't typically that what you see? Women are the ones that are trying to keep the relationships in order and trying to keep people communicating and in healthy relationships. And, and don't you typically see men? Well, okay, well, if that's the way they're going to be, that's their choice. And it just goes on. We, we still see this being true today. Sure. And what we see in Eve is that if, in fact, what some of these theologians are saying about the way Adam named Eve in a way of resentfulness, if, if, if that's really true, and then we see her having a child, we also see that she is, and we see this in families in 21st century you know, America today, moms will often substitute the relationship they're supposed to have with their husband and place all that, you know, affection on their children. We, we often see that. Yeah. And not only that, but um, children will allow a mother to relationally manage them where the husband will resist that from the wife oftentimes. I'm speaking generally here, but all of that to say, I think when we, when we come back to subsequent relationships, think about what's happening. The first thing that Adam and Eve do is they, they have sex right after the fall. That's what we see. They're trying to make themselves feel better. The fruit of that is Cain, a murderer. And then not even a chapter later, we see the situation with God is just discussed with the world. And so we're, we see Noah coming in the scene and it says that God is disgusted with the sin in these people. They're, they're marrying whoever they want. And that's not how it's supposed to be. Why would you marry? Right. Except for I'm attracted to that person. That's who I want to be with. That's there's a sexual connotation there. Mm -hmm. God is disgusted with all of this. And so he floods the earth and you know, you can just continue down through the pages of scripture and see the misappropriation of intimacy being abused. It's, oh. it's, a, it's an illegitimate way to get a legitimate need for intimacy met that was lost at the fall. Okay, so you just said that in Genesis 3 they were going to have children. Well, 
I didn't say that it said that in Genesis 3, did I? Yeah. You said okay, they were well, going to have children in Genesis 3. The children are going to come about. What I'm trying to get well, at at this okay. point is I know that ultimately where we're going with this is the efficacy of the Torah for bringing back um, order to right. what was made uh, wrong because Adam and Eve rejected God's instruction, sin, right. and then that came in to the picture, which leads to death. But the Torah, now it's got to be by the Spirit, but the intent of the Torah is, is uh, if done rightly by the Spirit, this is an avenue for life. We say no to our uh, sinful nature. We instead are bound to righteousness, and then we begin to walk in life uh, again by the Spirit. Now, what I'm trying to uh, reconcile in my mind as you have unpacked this for us is I know that you are a clinical person and you're meeting with people who are marred by the fall and your desire is to make them whole. And you also know that uh, our sexual um, identities are who, and not like gender, but sexual who we are sexually is a very uh, intimate, important part of who we are that uh, needs to be, uh, God is seeking to make that whole right and good. And my assumption is, is this is possible that the sexual encounter could be whole, right, and good. Yes? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Okay, so... At, so is That's it, the most powerful thing. That's what brings... That what, that's what perpetuates the people. That's what perpetuates God's people. If, if it wasn't for sexual relationships there wouldn't be any more people that is true <laughs> so it's got to be a good thing right and it, it is a when you start looking at the neurochemicals that happen when there's that intimate encounter sure okay that brings brain health which brings physical health i mean there's I, i'm thinking from just a neuroscience perspective of why sex is good let alone a spiritual perspective because when two people, and I mean a, a man and a woman, come together in a committed, monogamous, married relationship, that's the most beautiful expression of the image of God because it is a um, mutually beneficial, edifying way to love God and love one another. And... Um, I have said to clients before that the hottest sex you're ever going to have is two people who love God more than they love their spouse. And that's what they're giving is the most godly, deep, beautiful part of themselves in a vulnerable way that honors God in that marriage relationship to bring into right alignment in that moment together with God present. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. So is there a possibility then? So these are things that, uh, you know, right now I'm knee deep in uh, Romans and I went through Galatians with people and I'm, I'm not thinking about the fall and, and clinical th therapies and how people are made whole and all that. Is there at least the possibility that Adam and Eve were engaged in healthy, right sexual intimacy uh, before the fall. Well, you're going to ask me to speculate because it doesn't say it. It doesn't. So what? What I can this is this is all I know is that here's what the Bible says. Yeah. And we have to take it at face value. Yep. And we can't do eisegesis and determine determine what we think is there. We can only look at what is there, and. If, in fact, we take things literally for how they're developing, if we take them literally at face value, what we can see is that they hadn't made that decision in the garden yet. Made what decision? So, to eat from the tree of life okay, okay. or Got the it. tree of knowledge. Okay. And so they already knew right and wrong, right? Because they, they knew what was right and what was wrong. They mm -hmm. already knew right and wrong. But they got transformed when they ate from the tree of knowledge, because now they knew what was good and what was evil at this point. 
It, it and transformed God's, God's, in a negative way. Right. Okay. Exactly. And and then, you know, what, what does God say to them? What, what does God say here? What, why are you hiding? Now, all of a sudden, what do they know? Their nakedness is shame. Now, now they're, they're fearful. And so I'm saying that if you understand secure attachment, what the Torah is doing is it's bringing into right alignment into a secure attachment. If you understand attachment theory, that's what's happening with Torah is we're following in obedience in right alignment. Adam and Eve took that away from us so that what got, what got wired in was fear, anxiety, manipulation, insecurity. Okay. That's what got wired in. And Torah brings back right alignment. Okay. So uh, we're going to get to this right alignment as I uh, kind of figure this out with you. Can I say one more thing before I forget it? Yeah, of course. So as we're talking about how um, sexual relationships um, can be an illegitimate way to get a legitimate need for intimacy met, I think we're seeing all the different variants of that in our world today with all of this transgender, LGBTQ, XYZ. I mean, people are, I think, um, they're caught up in the current of the culture and they think because something feels good, so to speak, that it must be right. It must be who I am. Because think about the snake. What does he say to Eve? He's basically saying, did God really say that? So what? Listen to what's inside of you. Listen to what's inside of you. Why would you take external words to be your desire? Listen to what's inside of you. Don't you desire that? Don't you desire knowledge? That's, that's what you need to listen to is the desire inside you. And she became deceived. And she innocently was wanting to strengthen her role as the boundary keeper, as the relational keeper in the relationship. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're seeing that in this world today, people have this, this polluted understanding of what is, what feels good, what the desire is. And they're trying to get a legitimate need met through illegitimate measures that don't have anything to do with God. And we're seeing that even in our churches today, we're seeing ways of worshiping God that are not the ways that God wants to be worshiped. Gotcha. So if I were to go all the way back to uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, my understanding uh, in a very simplistic way would be that uh, part of what was going on there is that, that uh, they knew what was good and evil in the sense that they were completely uh, given over to God. God was in charge of good and evil. And in a sense, when they ate that, they were wanting to determine good and evil for themselves. And that was not, that was obviously not right and good uh, because then they fell away from God in that. Uh, and I do see how the transition in Genesis 4, what you're talking about there is a, I think it's a strong point uh, to have a legitimate need met in an illegitimate way. I see that. And of course, people have come on this channel in part, although we've had a very nice, um, you know, interesting sex dialogue here. Uh, I would think you and I would both concur that that sex is, uh, you know, there's an external thing going on there that is a can be pleasurable, but there's a there's a deeper intimacy that happens at that when two people are engaged in that and that should be right healthy and good and you have uh now said and i agree i just want to unpack it a little bit is that the torah somehow uh, brings things into proper alignment so that a man and woman uh, can come together in a healthy engagement and there's there's probably more depth there it's more about how humans relate to one another, what's right and good in society and all this stuff. I think I'm, I'm grabbing all this, but I think someone might be saying at this point, oh man, this is a, a Torah channel. What, is, what in the world does the Torah now have to do with um, bringing people into a, uh, a, a right and proper healthy dynamic 
uh, in themselves with one another that now we can uh, coexist male and female and in society in a right and good way. Uh, how would you respond to that? How would you unpack that for us? Well, I think your question changed, changed a couple times while you were talking. It probably so. did. <laughs> so help me. So hi, help ask me. Ask me the question again. Well, I just want to know how does the Torah, how does the Torah um, help bring us into proper alignment so that we can um, be husband, husbands and wives good again? Be, yeah. Okay. Well, when I turn on television or I open a newspaper and I look at what's happening in our world and the way our laws are changing and the way we have identity politics and all this kind of stuff, all you have to do is open up the Torah and see what is right and what is wrong and what is um, unholy and what is holy. And so when I look at uh, things today, I, I mean, I just, people are so far from wanting to know what's in the Torah. That's what I think. I think people are so far away from wanting to know what it's in there. I remember one time, Trevor, I don't know if I've ever said this to you or not, but I was, this has been many years ago now. This is when I was coming into really understanding discipleship because I believed in God. I grew up believing in God and all of that, but I had no idea about discipleship. It wasn't modeled in my home and it wasn't something that I understood as a young adult ministering in a church. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Yeah. But I remember as I started to get like this hunger to follow after um, the Bible and start studying it and digging deeply. And I was a, a director of music in a church at this point. And um, I asked the, the pastor that I was working with, and I already knew the answer, but I asked him, I said, is homosexuality a sin? And he said, no, that's nowhere in the Bible. And I thought, what the heck? I can point to multiple places in Torah where this is a sin. And you know what I did? I quit my job. And I left ministry and got in a Bible-centered church that was teaching the Bible from beginning to end as the authoritative word of God for today. And... Um, kind of got on that path. But I think that uh, people don't want to change how they're living. So there are many churches today that are <clears throat> allowing their faith to be an add on to what they're doing. And they morph uh, theology to fit the way they're wanting to live their life, rather than changing their life to fit what the scriptures say. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Well, I think, um, Sorry. Well, well, that's okay. I think, well, ultimately what I want to get to is, all right, so does the, is the Torah instructive to make us whole people? Is the Torah instructive yes. to facilitate intimacy and right intimacy? Yes. But how, why, how, how would you understand this as a therapist? Why is this a, um, why is this important for people to observe, to know, so that they can have healthy relationships and healthy understanding of their sexuality and so forth. Let me start by saying this, if I can. <laughs> I'm a story person. A few weeks ago, I took my almost eight-year-old granddaughter golfing, and I let her, my mistake, I let her drive the golf cart. And she tipped it on <laughs> going up a hill. <laughs> Heidi. <laughs> I know we're going up a hill and I'm letting her do the gas. I shouldn't have, I should have just let her steer. But anyway, she straddles and, and hide, you know, gets the cart up on the side and we tip the cart over a cliff. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> anyway, she said, Oh my, she calls me, Oma. don't tell my mom and my dad. Okay. What is the first thing that happens when we get to her house? I mean, I'm not even out of the car. Her parents are in the yard. She says, oh, oh, I shouldn't have done it. And I tipped the golf cart. She couldn't be in right relationship with them unless she purged what she had done wrong because she wanted to be in alignment with them so she could feel secure. Yeah. That's what Torah does for us. It keeps us in right alignment. It keeps us in a tight 
narrow, you know, space where like a baby coming out of the womb likes to be wrapped in the, in the swaddling clothes <clears throat> tightly. Mm-hmm. That's what Torah does for us. It wraps us in those swaddling clothes tightly. So we feel safe. Okay. So in your story, didn't you just say that your granddaughter confessed her sin immediately? Okay. That's fine. Wouldn't any evangelical Christian say, well, sure. I agree with that. We would confess our sin. Now we're in a right alignment with God. That doesn't mean I have to do anything. I don't have to uh, practice anything. Okay, but there are many Christians today that really don't have a right concept of what sin is. Oh. Torah points out what sin is and what sin isn't. It it points to what is holy and what is not. When we um, don't have a full perspective of a concept from Genesis to Revelation, and we just have this New Testament concept. What does it mean to abide in Christ in John 15? What does that mean without an understanding of the Torah? It's going to look different. And so you can honestly, innocently think you're abiding in Christ, think you're not sinning, and Torah brings into an understanding of what is holy and what is not. So, Heidi, I would say um, we're going to have to come back to the uh, whole uh, male-female and roles uh, conversation. Uh, by the way, if you're a listener and you saw me and uh, Heidi tossle a little bit at the beginning, we are friends. We've been friends a long time. And... Uh, You know, we are not professional podcasters by any stretch. So we are just, you know, talking through these sorts of things uh, in front of you candidly. And here's what I do know, Heidi. I know that uh, Yahweh has made them male and female on purpose to be completely equal and to make each other whole. And because I live in a fallen world and because of my, uh, past training and all this stuff uh i've been trained wrongly and i haven't i i know that we are uh we are we are co-equals in living out torah together as a man and wife as male and female co-ministers i haven't learned yet how to fully articulate it and i look forward to further unpacking what the torah uh, God's instruction has for us so that we can rightly understand uh, those roles so that we're, I guess, and I, I, again, I don't have the language, so we're not stepping on each other, but we are loving one another and helping one another and supporting each other's strengths and making each other beautiful. And I'm not sure quite how to do that yet. And you might be able to help me, us, uh, do that in a better way. So, uh, yes, I know that you um, have your... Uh, passed in regular churches. And so there's that language that you were using. Um, but, you know, I, I just think about my relationship with Amy and how I, I am so rich, Heidi. I am so rich in that Amy and I are on the same page with the Torah. We are on the same uh, page when it comes to desiring to be disciples. And we do have uh, a sexual intimacy that quite frankly is very innocent and loving and caring and it happens in the crucible of this obedience and I'm not sure how to unpack that in a mm-hmm. in a clinical counselor way for everybody and I think it would be kind of neat to get to that uh, with you as we continue along in our podcast so I'm gonna give you the last word or any last thoughts you have um, about our uh, conversation before we leave today Hmm. Well, thank you for having me here today. I I feel like this is the beginning of um, what I hope are many conversations that will help not just you and I unpack things, but but the listener to unpack it too. Because when we when we operate in the right relationship between male and female, what is marriage? Marriage is practice for we are the bride of Christ. So it is for the, the, the great feast when we are reunited as Christ's bride. So um, I think that's a very important thing to unpack because of the significance of what the marriage represents. Perfect. Hey, uh, everyone. 
uh, we, Heidi and I will continue to dialogue, struggle through this. Uh, you know, my goal always with Everyday Torah is to show you how beautiful that is. Uh, I know that people want to be disciples of the uh, the Messiah that died for them. We are saved by grace through faith, but we want to respond to that grace uh, in a way, in a life that we press into the narrative of Jesus. And in that way, obedience is no longer legalism. We are doing it because we want to keep in step with the Spirit. We want to be uh, we want to be the kinds of people that allow God to determine what is good and evil. And so we want to read in the Word of God what is good, what is right, what is true, what is holy, what makes us look like separate holy people. That's our goal. Yeshua, of course, is our exemplar, our God who showed us what the Torah looks like, lived perfectly. Looks what it looks it looks like Jesus when lived in love. So Jesus followed that Torah every day of his life. And if we want to be like Jesus, we gotta to seek to follow that Torah, God's instruction, every day of our lives, and that's why we call it everyday Torah. See you next time.